Welcome to Global Forum, a platform for discussion of global issues from global perspectives. Today's focus is going to be on the U.S. presidential and congressional elections and the extent to which human rights and civil liberties have been or have not been reflected in these elections. We have invited a number of distinguished guests to talk about these issues. That includes Professor Peter Lender, that includes Attorney Mahar, Sean Mahar, and also Ms. Karpova, who is a peace activist and also a civil rights activist. But before I bring them on, let's hear a statement by Senator Mike Grewal, who is a U.S. presidential election at this candidate at this time, and he's one of the very few people who have taken such a clear and precise stand on civil liberties. Here is Senator Mike Grewal. This is Senator Mike Gravel. I want to weigh in on a subject uh, with respect to the Bush administration and uh, the horrible approach that they take uh, to justice, in fact, the injustice as they continue to perpetuate. Uh, we can deal objectively many times to these injustices in the abstract when we talk about the terrible things they do with respect to torture in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. But when you know the people personally, it takes a, a personal and a different dimension. I've met the daughter of Dr. Uh, Al-Aryan, uh, and I want to tell you this is a personal injustice. Here is a man of peace who was brought to trial by the Justice Department of George Bush, and in a Tampa court by a jury, he was declared innocent. And that's after the government spent over $50 million on this court case. And that's after they had interviewed Mossad agents, they had thousands of people, thousands of hours and testimony, and they didn't have any substantial evidence to, to convict him. So he was declared innocent. Time Magazine went so far as to say that this was a terrible setback to George Bush. And of course, it was a wonderful victory for the Constitution of the United States. And, and now they were, they were committed at the time to release him in 05. And that time has passed. He is still in prison to this day. And there's no reason for that. And you get all the machinations within these uh, prosecutorial uh, demons who are trying to find some minor excuse to turn around and hang on to him and keep him in prison or re-prosecute him on some technicalities. Uh, they're, what they're trying to do, they're trying to save face. They're trying to save face for having been rejected in a court of law by his peers. And I just want to underscore the crime, the crime that this represents by our judicial system, by the White House of George Bush, and by this great injustice that Americans should abhor and stand up against. I will tell you, I am a candidate for president. If I do become president, all of these injustices and all of these prosecutors are going to have their names raked through the public. We're going to release all the secret activities that these people have been doing. And, I, and mark this well. They, it'll be like what we did with the Stasis when the Iron Curtain fell. People will be able to rake through all of this and see all the crimes that have been hidden through the American people. So really, take this to the bank you're going to find out the great damage they did to this innocent person, Dr. al Arian. And I want to tell you, this is an injustice of a magnitude difficult to comprehend. I want to add my voice, and I hope that decent people within the administration will stand up and reverse the decisions made by the White House. Today we will be focusing on the U.S. presidential election and as well as congressional elections. What we're going to talk about more specifically is the relationship between agenda setting as part of the electoral process and more specifically the issue of civil liberties and U.S. presidential and congressional elections. I've invited two friends. To my right is Mr. Sean Mahar. He is a attorney, practicing attorney, civil rights attorney, and he is right now 
representing some important uh, uh, clients, and I hope he'll talk about the issues and what they're in prison for. And we also have Professor Peter Lender, Professor of Law at William Mitchell College in Minnesota, who is also the former president of National Lawyers Guild, uh, uh, and also current president of Defense Lawyers Association, affiliate with the United Nations Commission on uh, uh, Rwanda. I welcome both of you. Hello, thank you. Thank uh, you. And let me ask you, how do you see the issue of election and the issue of agenda setting in which, you know, the things are put, uh, the important things uh, are put placed on the agenda, people reflect on that, people debate on, and then they vote on them. Is the agenda setting process including the issue of civil liberties at this time? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, what Sean's experience is, but I, I, of course I, I haven't heard much of this uh, civil liberties discussion, and th I think there's some political explanations for it. The, uh, uh, the question of uh, avoiding or the need to avoid the appearance of being soft on terrorism, I think, uh, has cowed the Democratic candidates from speaking about these issues and perhaps uh, the Republican candidates as well because the opposite side of protecting civil liberties is that government power has to be restrained. And if government power is restrained in the atmosphere that is, exists in Washington these days, the politicians who would suggest that become suspect. Um, uh, however, underlying this election are extremely important civil liberties issues, and um, one would hope that the American people in 2008 might do something uh, like they did in 1800 with the Alien and Sedition Acts, where there was this huge uh, outflowing of uh, democratic support for Jefferson to get rid of those Alien and Sedition Acts. A vote against the Patriot Act by the American people would be a, a wonderful thing, but first we need a politician who says he's against yeah. it, or she. I think that no one seems to be speaking about civil liberties in this election it is astounding. What has been going on the last few years? Let's take one example, wiretapping of U.S. citizens. We now know through Eric Lickbaugh and other journalists who have investigated this that the Bush administration has had complete authority to wiretap American citizens both in their telephone calls and their emails, clearly in violation of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Where are the Democrats on this? Where are the Republicans on this? This has been going back and forth for months now, when it's clear as day that the president has been violating the law. The closest analogy was the 70s, when it was found out that the Nixon administration was doing this. And what happened? You know, you had the church committee hearings. You had basically a huge uproar among the American citizenry that the federal government had this power and abused it so profoundly. But here, this isn't even talked about in the general election cycle that I'm seeing. Well, I think that, that speaks to the success that uh, the Bush administration has had in creating the impression that there's an enemy or that there's a danger that's so great that uh, ordinary law uh, shouldn't apply, either internationally or domestically. And uh, that propaganda has been so successful that those of us who are concerned about civil liberties, who uh, who defend people who are accused of, of terrorism or, or whatever that is. Of course, terrorism is actually politically motivated violence. It's uh, difficult to see how that's going to be stamped out anytime soon. Um, but it's been used politically to cow the American people into think that, uh, thinking that the executive needs unlimited powers, and they've been very successful at it. Well, Professor Allender, we both know, we all know, that there are at least 400 cities and counties and few states in this country that have independent of each other passed resolutions asking for complete or partial repeal of the USA Patriot Act and have even vowed you know, not to spend any of your money to implement the questionable clauses of the, the, this law. The question I have for you is when there's such a grassroots movement, people independent of each other doing these things, why there is no national recognition, national name and national face for this movement? Well, uh, I think it's related to the propaganda value of creating a, an enemy that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm happy to say that actually I was uh, involved in, in some of the early stages of this uh, Bill of Rights Defense Committee movement, along with Dr. Samuel Arian, who uh, later was prosecuted and who I'm now defending. But uh, there was an immediate response at the grassroots level in opposition to the Patriot Act, and it, it has gone across the country at the local level. 